Something, somewhere, somewhen, must have happened differently. Petunia Evans married Michael Varis, a professor of biochemistry at Oxford. Harry James Potter Evans Varis grew up in a house filled to the brim with books. He once bit a math teacher who didn't know what a logarithm was. He's read Gödel, Escher, Bach, and Judgment Under Uncertainty, Heuristics and Biases, and Volume 1 of the Feynman Lectures on Physics. And despite what everyone who's met him seems to fear, he doesn't want to become the next Dark Lord. He was raised better than that. He wants to discover the laws of magic and become a god. Hermione Granger is doing better than him in every class, except broomstick riding. Draco Malfoy is exactly what you would expect an 11-year-old boy to be like if Darth Vader were his doting father. Professor Quirrell is living his lifelong dream of teaching defense against the dark arts, or as he prefers to call his class, battle magic. His students are all wondering what's going to go wrong with the defense professor this time. Dumbledore is either insane or playing some vastly deeper game which involves setting fire to a chicken. Deputy Headmistress Minerva McGonagall needs to go off somewhere private and scream for a while. Presenting Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. You ain't guessing where this one's going. The terrifying part was how fast the whole thing had spiraled out of control. Albus, something has to be done! In every city, the population has been divided for a long time past into the blue and the green factions. And they fight against their opponents knowing not for what end they imperil themselves. So there grows up in them against their fellow men a hostility which has no cause, and at no time does it cease or disappear. For it gives place neither to the ties of marriage, nor of relationship, nor of friendship. And the cause is the same even though those who differ with respect to these colors be brothers or any other kin. I, for my part, am unable to call this anything except a disease of the soul. I'm sorry, I don't... Procopius, they took their chariot racing very seriously in the Roman Empire. Yes. Minerva, I agree that something must be done. Soon. Albus, I think it must be done before Saturday. On Sunday, most students would leave Hogwarts to stay the holiday with their families. Saturday, then, was the final battle of the three first-year armies that would determine the awarding of Professor Quirrell's thrice-cursed Christmas wish. You fear that the explosion will come then, and someone will be hurt, and that Professor Quirrell will be blamed. Albus, we cannot lose Professor Quirrell now. We cannot! If he but stays through January, our fifth years will pass their owls. If he stays through March, our seventh years will pass their newts. He is remedying years of neglect in months. A whole generation will grow up able to defend themselves in spite of the Dark Lord's curse. You must stop the battle, Albus. Ban the armies now! I am not sure the defense professor would take that kindly. He did seem most attached to his armies, though when I agreed, I thought there would be four in each year. A clever man, probably with the best intentions, but perhaps not clever enough, I fear. And banning the armies might also trigger the explosion. But then, Albus, what will you do? Why, I shall plot, of course. It is the new fashion in Hogwarts. The terrifying part was how fast the whole thing had spiraled out of control. The first battle in December had been... messy, or so Draco had heard. The second battle had been deranged. And the next one would be worse, unless the three of them together succeeded in their last desperate attempt to stop it. Professor Quirrell, this is insanity. This isn't Slytherin anymore. It's just... You can't possibly do any real plots with all this stuff going on. Last battle, one of my soldiers faked his own suicide. We have Hufflepuffs trying to plot, and they think they can, but they can't. Things just happen at random now. It doesn't have anything to do with who's cleverest, or which army fights best. It's... He couldn't even describe it. I agree with Mr. Malfoy. 
Allowing traitors isn't working, Professor Coral. Draco had tried forbidding anyone in his army to plot except him, and that had just driven the plots underground. No one wanted to be left out when the soldiers in other armies got to plot. After miserably losing their last battle, he'd finally given in and revoked his decree. But by then, his soldiers had already started setting their own personal plans in motion without any sort of central coordination. After being told all the plans, or what his soldiers claimed were their plans, Draco had tried to sketch a plot to win the final battle. It had required considerably more than three different things to go right, and Draco had used Incendio on the paper and Averto to vanish the ashes, because if Father had seen it, he would have been disowned. And you, Mr. Potter, are you likewise in agreement? All we'd need to do is shoot Franz Ferdinand and we could start World War I. It's gone completely to chaos. I'm all for it. That's right, I'm betraying you. Both of you, again! Ha <laughs> ha! And why is that, Mr. Potter? Because I think I can cope with the chaos better than Miss Granger or Mr. Malfoy. Our war is a zero-sum game, and it doesn't matter whether it's easy or hard in an absolute sense, only who does better or worse. Harry Potter was learning far too fast. Professor Quirrell's eyes moved beneath their lids to regard Draco, and then Granger. In truth, Mr. Malfoy, Miss Granger, I simply could not live with myself if I shut down the grand debacle before its climax. One of your soldiers has even become a quadruple agent. Quadruple? But there's only three sides in the war. Yes, you'd think that, wouldn't you? I am not sure that there has ever in history been a quadruple agent, or any army with such a high fraction of real and pretended traitors. We are exploring new realms, Miss Granger, and we cannot turn back now. Draco left the defense professor's office with his teeth gritting hard against each other, and Granger looking even more annoyed beside him. I can't believe you did that, Harry. Remember, Hermione, it is just a game, and why should generals like us be the only ones who get to plot? And besides, what are the two of you going to do about it? Team up against me? Harry had been relying, more and more openly and gloatingly, on Draco's refusal to make common cause with a mudblood girl. And Draco was beginning to get sick of having that used against him. If this kept up much longer, he was going to ally with Granger, just to crush Harry Potter, and see how much the son of a mudblood liked that. The terrifying part was how fast the whole thing had spiraled out of control. Tell me, is there anyone in my army who isn't a spy? Her question had put an ironic smile on the young Slytherin's face. Blaise Zabini always seemed a little disdainful of her, but he didn't seem to actively dislike her. Nothing like the derision he held for Draco Malfoy, or the resentment he had developed for Harry Potter. She had worried at first about Zabini betraying her, but the boy seemed desperate to show that the other two generals were no better than him. And while Hermione thought that Zabini would probably be happy to sell her out to anyone else, he'd never let Malfoy or Harry win. Most of your soldiers are still loyal to you, I'm pretty sure. It's just that no one wants to be left out of the fun. So they think they can be double agents and secretly work for our side while pretending to betray us. And that would also go for anyone in the other armies who says that they want to be our spy. I think I did a good job of telling which ones really want to sell out Malfoy. I'm not sure anyone really wants to sell out Potter to you, but not is a sure bet for betraying Potter to Malfoy. And since I had Entwistle approach him, supposedly on behalf of Malfoy, and Entwistle really reports to us, that's almost as good. We're going to lose, aren't we? Look, you are in the lead now in Quirrell points. We just have to not lose this last battle completely, and you'll have enough Quirrell points to win the Christmas wish. Professor Quirrell had announced that the final battle would operate on a formal scoring system, which he'd been asked to do to avoid recriminations afterward. Each time you shot someone, the general of your army got two quarrel points. A gong would ring through the battle area. They didn't know yet where they would be fighting, though Hermione was hoping for the forest again, where Sunshine did well. And its pitch would tell which army had won the points. And if anyone was faking being hit, the gong would ring out anyway, and then a double gong would ring later, after no fixed time, to hail the retraction. And if you called the name of an army, cried, FOR SUNSHINE! Or, FOR CHAOS! Or, for Dragon! It switched your allegiance to that army. Even Hermione had been able to see the flaw in that set of rules. But Professor Quirrell had gone on to announce that if you'd been originally assigned to Sunshine, nobody could shoot you in the name of Sunshine. Or rather, they could, 
But then Sunshine lost a single coral point, symbolized by a triple gong. That prevented you from shooting your own soldiers for points, and discouraged suiciding before the enemy got you, but you could still shoot spies if you had to. Right now, Hermione had 244 quarrel points, and Malfoy had 219, and Harry had 221. There were 24 soldiers in each army. So we fight carefully, and just try to not lose too badly. The problem is, Malfoy and Potter both know that their only way to win is to combine and crush us then fight it out on their own. So here is what I think we should do. Zabini's plan hadn't been the obvious one. It had been strange and complicated and layered and the sort of thing she would have expected Harry to come up with, not Zabini. It felt wrong just for her to be able to understand a plan like that. Young girls shouldn't be able to understand plans like that. The hat would have sorted her into Slytherin if it seemed that she could understand plans like that. The awesome thing was how fast he'd been able to escalate the chaos once he started doing it deliberately. Harry sat in his office. He'd been given the authority to order furniture from the house elves, so he'd ordered a throne, and curtains in a black and crimson pattern. Something in Harry felt like he'd finally come home. Before him stood the four lieutenants of chaos, his most trusted minions, one of whom was a traitor. This, this was what life should be like. We are gathered. Let chaos reign. My hovercraft is full of eels. I will not buy this record. It is scratched. All Mimsy were the borough groves. And the Mumraths outgrabe. That concluded the formalities. How goes the confusion? Harry said in a dry whisper like Emperor Palpatine. It goes well, General Chaos, said Neville in tones he always used for military matters a tone so deep that the boy often had to stop and cough. Our legionnaires have begun five new plots since yesterday evening. Do any of them have a chance of working? I don't think so. Excellent. That brought the total to 60. Let Draco try to handle that. Let him try. And as for Blaze Abini, Harry laughed again, and this time it didn't even take an effort to sound evil. He really needed to borrow someone's pet measle for his staff meetings, so he'd have a cat to stroke while he did this. Can the Legion stop making plots now? I mean, don't we have enough already? No, we can never have enough plots. Professor Quirrell had put it perfectly. They were pushing the boundaries further, perhaps, than they had ever been pushed. And Harry wouldn't have been able to live with himself if he turned back now. There came a knock at the door. That will be the Dragon General. He arrives precisely as I expected. Do show him in, and yourselves out. And the four lieutenants of Chaos shuffled out, casting dark looks at Draco as the enemy general entered into Harry's secret lair. If he wasn't allowed to do this when he was older, Harry was just going to stay eleven forever. Draco was beginning to feel a lot more confident that he'd done the right thing in deciding to overthrow Harry Potter before he could take over the world. Draco couldn't even imagine what it would be like to live under his rule. Good evening, Dragon General. You have arrived just as I expected. This was not surprising, considering that Draco and Harry had agreed on the meeting time in advance. And it also wasn't evening, but by now, Draco knew better than to say anything. General Potter, you know that our two armies have to work together for either of us to win Professor Quirrell's wish, right? Yes. We must cooperate to destroy Sunshine, and only then fight it out between us. But if one of us betrays the other earlier on, that one could gain an advantage in the later fight. And the Sunshine General, who knows all this, will try to trick each of us into thinking the other has betrayed them. And you and I, who know that, will be tempted to betray the other and pretend that it is Granger's trickery. And Granger knows that as well. And both of us only want to win, 
and there's no one else who'll punish either of us if we defect. Precisely, we are faced with a true prisoner's dilemma. The prisoner's dilemma, according to Harry's teachings, ran thus. Two prisoners had been locked in separate cells. There was evidence against each prisoner, but only minor evidence, enough for a prison sentence of two years apiece. Each prisoner could opt to defect, betray the other, testifying against them in court. This would take one year off their own prison sentence, but add two years to the others. Or a prisoner could cooperate, staying silent. So if both prisoners defected, each testifying against the other, they would serve three years apiece. If both cooperated or stayed silent, they would serve two years each. But if one defected and the other cooperated, the defector would serve a single year and the cooperator would serve four. And both prisoners had to make their decision without knowing the other one's choice, and neither would be given a chance to change their decision afterward. You said that the rational solution to the prisoner's dilemma is to cooperate. But of course you would want me to believe that, wouldn't you? I wouldn't fake your lessons, but I have to remind you, Draco, that I didn't say you should just automatically cooperate. Not on a true prisoner's dilemma like this one. What I said was that when you choose, you shouldn't think like you're choosing for just yourself or like you're choosing for everyone. You should think like you're choosing for all the people who are similar enough to you that they'll probably do the same thing you do for the same reasons. And also choosing the predictions made by anyone who knows you well enough to predict you accurately so that you never have to regret being rational because of the correct predictions that other people make about you. Remind me to explain about Newcomb's problem at some point. So the question you and I have to ask, Draco, is this. Are we similar enough that we'll probably do the same thing, whatever it is, making our decisions in mostly the same way? Or do we know each other well enough to predict each other so that I can predict whether you'll cooperate or defect, and you can predict that I've decided to do the same thing I predict you'll do because I know that you can predict me deciding that. And Draco could not help but think that since he had to strain just to understand half of that, the answer was obviously no. Yes. I see. Ah, well. I guess we'll have to think of some other way then. Draco hadn't thought that was going to work. Draco and Harry talked about it back and forth. They had both agreed much earlier that what they did on the battlefield would not count as broken promises in real life, though Draco was a little angry about what Harry had done in Professor Quirrell's office and said so. But if the two of them couldn't rely on honor or friendship, that did leave the question of how to get their armies to work together on beating Sunshine, despite everything Granger might try to break them up. Professor Quirrell's rules didn't make it tempting to let Sunshine kill the other army's soldiers. That just increased the bar you had to pass yourself. But it did tempt each side to steal kills instead of acting like a single army would, or to shoot some of the other side's soldiers during the confusion of battle. Hermione was walking back to Ravenclaw, not really looking where she was going, her mind preoccupied with war and treachery and other age-inappropriate concepts, when she turned a corner and bumped straight into a grown-up. Don't worry, Miss Granger. You are quite forgiven said the cheerful smile, set beneath the twinkling eyes and above the silver beard of the headmaster of Hogwarts. Her gaze was helplessly locked on the kindly face of the most powerful wizard in the world, who was also the chief warlock, who was also the supreme mugwump, who had gone insane years ago from the stress of fighting the Dark Lord, and numerous other facts that were popping up into her mind one after the other while her throat went on making little embarrassing squeaks. In fact, Miss Granger, it is quite lucky that we have bumped into each other. Why, I was just now wondering curiously what the three of you were thinking of asking for your wishes. Saturday dawned bright and clear and with the students speaking in hushed voices, as though the first to shout might set off the explosion. Draco had hoped that they would be fighting in the upper levels of Hogwarts again. Professor Quirrell had said that real fights were more likely to take place in cities than forests, and fighting inside schoolrooms and corridors was supposed to simulate that, with ribbons to mark the allowed areas. Dragon Army had done well in those fights. Instead, just as Draco had feared, Professor Quirrell had come up with something special for this battle. The battleground was the Hogwarts Lake, and not in boats either. All the soldiers had been issued potions of underwater action that allowed them to breathe, see clearly, 
talk to each other, and swim not quite as fast as a fast walk by kicking their legs. War in water. You couldn't defend a perimeter, attackers could come at you from any direction, and even with the potion you couldn't see very far in the darkness of the lake. And if you swam too far away from the action, you would start to glow after a while and be easy to hunt down. Ordinarily, if an army scattered and ran instead of fighting, Professor Quirrell would just declare them defeated. But today they were working on a point system. Of course, you still had some time before you started to glow, if you wanted to play Assassin. Dragon Army had been set low in the water at the start of the game. Draco kicked his legs a few times, propelling him to a higher position from which he could gaze down at where his soldiers hovered in the water. The conversations died down almost at once under Draco's icy glare, his soldiers looking up at him with gratifying expressions of fear and worry. Listen to me very carefully. There's only one way we can win this. We've got to march on Sunshine together with Chaos and beat Sunshine. Then we fight it out with Potter and win. That's got to happen, understand? No matter what else goes on, that part has to happen that way. And Draco explained the plan he and Harry had come up with. Astonished looks were exchanged among the soldiers. And if any of your plots get in the way of that, then after we are out of the water, I will set you on fire. There was a nervous chorus of yes sirs. And everyone with secret orders, make sure you carry them out to the letter. Around half his soldiers openly nodded, and Draco marked them for death after he rose to power. Of course, all the private orders were fake, like one dragon being told to offer a false traitor's commission to another dragon, and the second dragon being told in hushed confidence to report anything said by the first dragon. Draco had told each dragon that the whole war could depend on that one thing, and that he hoped they understood it was more important than the plans they'd previously made. With luck, that would keep all the idiots happy, and maybe flush out a few spies to boot, if the reports didn't match the instructions. Draco's real plan for winning against Chaos... Well, it was simpler than the one he'd burned, but Father still wouldn't have liked it. Despite trying, though, Draco hadn't been able to think of anything better. It was a plot that couldn't possibly have worked against anyone except Harry Potter. In fact, it had been Harry's plan originally, according to the traitor, though Draco had guessed that without being told. Draco and the traitor had just modified it a little. Harry took a deep breath, feeling the water gurgle harmlessly into his lungs. They'd fought in the forest, and he hadn't gotten a chance to say it. They'd fought in the corridors of Hogwarts, and he hadn't gotten a chance to say it. They'd fought in the air, broomsticks issued to every soldier, and it still hadn't made sense to say it. Harry had thought he wouldn't ever get to say those words, not while he was still young enough for them to be real. The Chaos Legionnaires were looking at Harry in puzzlement as their general swam with his feet pointing up toward the distant light of the surface, and his head pointed down toward the murky depths. Why are you upside down? The young commander shouted at his army, and began to explain how to fight after you abandoned the privileged orientation of gravity. A hollow, booming bell echoed through the water, and on the instant, Zabini and Anthony and five other soldiers struck out downward into the murky depths of the lake. General Granger swallowed a lump in her throat as she watched them go. She was risking everything on this, dividing her army instead of just trying to take as many enemy soldiers with them as possible. The thing to realize, Zabini had told her, was that no army would move until they had a plan that let them expect victory. Sunshine couldn't just plan to win themselves, they had to make both other armies think they could win until it was too late. Ernie and Ron still looked like they were in shock. Susan was gazing after the disappearing soldiers with a calculating look. Her army, what was left of it, just looked bewildered. Now what? Now we wait. All of us left here are gonna get zapped. But that was gonna happen anyway with Dragon and Chaos ganging up on us. We've just gotta take as many of them with us as we can. I've got a plan! It's, like, all complicated, but I know how we can get Dragon and Chaos to start fighting each other. Me too. I've got a plan too. See, Neville Longbottom is secretly on our side. You were talking to Neville. That's not right. I was the one who... Daphne Greengrass and a couple of other Slytherins who hadn't gone with Zabini were giggling helplessly as the cries of No, wait! I was the one who got Longbottom! erupted from one soldier after another. Hermione just looked at them all wearily. Okay, 
Does everyone get it? All your plots were faked by the Chaos Legion, or maybe by some dragon. Anyone who really wanted to betray Harry or Malfoy went straight to Mir Zabini, not you. Just go ahead and compare notes on all your secret plots and you'll see it for yourselves. She might not be as good at plotting as Zabini, but she could always understand what all her officers told her. That was why Professor Quirrell had made her the general. So don't bother trying to do any plots when the other armies get here. Just fight, okay? Please? But Neville is in Hufflepuff! You're saying he lied to us? Daphne was laughing so hard and so helplessly that the exhalations had turned her upside down in the water. I'm not sure what Longbottom is, but I don't think he's a Hufflepuff anymore. Not now that Harry Potter's got to him. Do you know, I asked him that, and Neville told me he had become a Chaos Hufflepuff. Anyway, Zabini took everyone who we thought was a spy, so in our army we can stop watching each other quite so hard now, I hope. Anthony was a spy? Parvati was a spy? Parvati was totally a spy. She shopped at the spy shoe store and wore spy lipstick, and someday she's going to marry a nice spy husband and have a lot of little spies. And then a gong sound echoed through the water, indicating that Sunshine had just scored two points. This was shortly followed by the triple gong of Dragon losing a single point. Traitors weren't allowed to kill generals, not after the disaster of the first battle in December when all three generals had been shot in the first minute. But with any luck... Oh, it sounds like Mr. Crab is taking a little nap. Like two shoals of fish, the armies swam along. Neville Longbottom kicked his feet in slow, measured motions. Diving, always diving in whatever direction you happen to be moving. You wanted to show the enemy the smallest profile, present them with your head or your feet. So you were always diving, downward and head first, and the enemy was always down. Like every Chaos Legionnaire in the army, Neville's head was constantly rotating as he swam, looking up, down, around, to every side. Not just watching for Sunshine soldiers, but watching for any sign that a Chaos Legionnaire had drawn their wand and was about to betray them. Usually, traitors waited until the confusion of battle to make their move, but that early gong had put them all on guard. The truth was, Neville was feeling sad about that. In November, he'd been a soldier in a united army, all of them pulling together and helping each other, and now they were all watching each other constantly for the first signs of betrayal. It might have been more fun for General Chaos, but it wasn't nearly as much fun for Neville. The direction formerly known as Up was getting steadily brighter as they came closer to the surface and sunshine. If there were sunny traders, the time was approaching for them to strike. Now! Now! For sunshine! shouted all the soldiers in both armies and charged downward. What? All of Hogwarts was watching this battle as they had watched the first. I warned you, Headmaster. It is impossible to have rules without Mr. Potter exploiting them. For long, precious seconds, as the 47 soldiers charged her own 17, Hermione's mind went blank. Why? Then, it all snapped into place. Every time a soldier originally from Sunshine got shot by someone crying the name of Sunshine, she would lose a quarrel point. When two Sunshine soldiers were shot by either army, both enemy armies would be two points closer to overtaking her. It was the same game, only shared. And if anyone shot another soldier not in the name of Sunshine, that gong wouldn't get lost in the confusion. Hermione was suddenly very glad that Zabini hadn't gone with the obvious plan of starting trouble between the other two armies while they attacked Sunshine. It was still disheartening, though, that sense of your chances closing down, of hope being taken away. Most of Hermione's soldiers were still looking confused, but some had expressions of dawning horror as they got it. It's alright. Our job is the same, to take as many of them with us as we can. And remember, Zabini took away all the spies. We don't have to stay on the lookout like they do. It can be like it was in November. We just have to keep our heads high, fight our best, and trust each other. Daphne shot her. BLOOD FOR THE BLOOD GOD! Captain Weasley spun and raised his wand toward Neville and fired, but Neville was swimming downward toward him, wand pointed straight ahead, and that meant the simple shield could shelter Neville's entire profile. If anyone shot him now, it wasn't going to be Sunny Ron. 
A grimly determined look came over Captain Weasley's face, and he arrowed straight up toward Neville, mouthing the word Contigo, though the shield wasn't visible in the water. The two enemy champions shot toward each other like arrows released from bows, each aimed to split the other down the middle. They had dueled many times before, but this time would pay for all. Rainbows and unicorns! The Black Goat with a thousand young! Do your homework! Closer and yet closer, the two champions charged, neither willing to swerve. The first person to turn would present a vulnerable broadside and get shot. Though if neither lost their nerve, they would crash right into each other. Falling straight down as the enemy rose straight up to meet him, Hammer descending to meet Anvil in a path neither was willing to leave. Special attack! Chaotic twist! Neville saw the look of horror on Captain Weasley's face as the hover charm caught him. They tested it before the battle had started, and just as Harry had suspected, when Guardium Leviosa became a whole new sort of weapon once everyone was swimming underwater. Curse you, Longbottom! Can't you ever fight without your dumb special attacks? And by that time, the Sunshine Captain had been spun around sideways and Neville shot him in the leg. I don't fight fair. I fight like Harry Potter. It still hurt every time he had to shoot Hermione. Harry could hardly stand to look at the expression of peace that had come over her sleeping face. And if Harry had tried to duck out of being the one to shoot her, not only would Draco have known what it meant, Hermione would have been offended. She's not dead, Harry said to his brain as his kicking feet pushed him away. She's just resting. Idiot! The two armies swiftly separated, becoming two shoals of fish once more. General Granger had gone down 17 points and taken three Chaotix and two Dragons with her, and one Chaotic and two Dragons had been shot as traitors. So she'd lost net seven points. Harry had lost one, Draco had lost two. That put Sunshine 20 points up on Draco and 17 points up on Chaos. Chaos could still win easily if they exterminated all 20 remaining Dragons. The wild card, of course, being those seven remaining Sunshine soldiers if you could call them that. The two shoals swam uneasily next to each other, the soldiers in each army awaiting an order to call out their true allegiances and attack. Everyone who got them, remember special orders one through three, and don't forget it's Merlin says on three, do not acknowledge. The trustworthy two thirds of the army did not nod, and the other third just looked puzzled. Special order one, don't bother trying to call out any code words in this battle. Don't expend any effort on any plot not specially approved by the commander. Just swim, shield, and fire. Hermione and Draco had both been fighting their soldiers, trying to get them to stop plotting on their own all through December. Harry had egged his soldiers on and supported their plotting through the last two battles, while also telling them that at some future point he might ask them to put a plot or two on hold, to which they'd all readily agreed. So now, in this critical battle, they were happy to obey. Neither Hermione or Draco could have given that order successfully, Harry was certain. It was the difference between the soldiers seeing you as an ally in their plotting, and seeing you as a spoil sport old fuddy-duddy who didn't want them to have any fun. Imposition of order equaled escalation of chaos, and it also worked in reverse. There they are! From the depths of the lake rose the Forgotten Ones, the ones who'd forsaken the last battle, the seven missing sunshine soldiers glowing with the bright aura of cowards, now fading as they returned to battle. There was a moment of held breath. Then, the seven Sunshine soldiers swam up to join Dragon Army. There was a triumphant cheer from Dragon Army. There were cries of dismay from a third of the Chaos Legion. Some of the other two-thirds smiled, though they shouldn't have. Harry wasn't smiling. Oh, this is so completely not going to work. But Harry hadn't been able to think of anything better. Special Orders 2 and 3 still apply! Fight! For the Chaos Legion! For Dragon Army! And the Chaotix dived straight downward as all the traitors got ready to strike. Draco's head darted around frantically, trying to weigh up what was happening. Somehow, despite his greater forces, he'd lost the initiative. Four small Chaotic forces were being pursued by four larger Dragon forces. But because Draco's forces were the ones trying to force an engagement, it meant that they had to follow where Chaos ran and somehow that was producing concentrations of chaotic force that would fire into the exposed sides of Dragon. 
It was happening again! Prismatis! That shield you could see, even through the water. A sparkling, multicolored flat wall wide enough to shield Draco and the five other dragons with him from the chaotic force that had just swam past. And that let the other five dragons turn their attentions back to the chaotic force that they'd been chasing. There was a tense moment as sleep spell after sleep spell crashed into Draco's prismatic wall. And Draco was hoping to Merlin that none of those four chaotics had learned the breaking drill hex. Then there was the bell of a dragon victory and the chaotic forces spun head for foot and began swimming away. And Draco, his hands now shaking slightly, dropped the prismatic wall and lowered his wand. Fighting in water was more exhausting even than fighting on broomsticks. Do not pursue! Sonorous! REFORM ON ME! The dragon forces started converging on Draco, and the chaotic forces spun around and began pursuing the dragons on the instant. Draco swore out loud as he heard the bell of a chaotic victory. Someone hadn't gotten their simple shield oriented right. And then the dragon forces were in supporting range of each other, and the chaotic were moving back into the murky distance. Somehow, despite their numerical superiority, the dragons had scored three times against the Chaotix, and the Chaotix had scored four times back, and he'd heard one dragon spy get executed. Either Harry Potter had thought of a lot of very good ideas very fast, or for some unimaginable reason he'd already spent a lot of time working out how to fight underwater. This wasn't working, the battle might last long enough that time would be called. He had to rethink things fast. What is it? said Padma Patil as she and her force swam over toward Draco. Padma was the second in command. She was clever and powerful, and better yet, she hated Granger and saw Harry as a rival, which made her trustworthy. Working with Padma was making him realize the truth of an old adage that Ravenclaw was sister to Slytherin. Draco had been surprised when his father had told him it was an acceptable house for his future wife, but now he saw the sense in it. Wait until we're all here. The truth was, he needed to catch his breath. That was the trouble with being the general and the most powerful wizard. You had to keep using magic. Zabini came in next, commanding a force of two sunnies and four dragons, one of whom was Gregory keeping an eye on Zabini. Draco didn't trust Zabini. And neither Draco nor Zabini trusted the sunnies enough to make them a majority of any unit. They were supposed to be loyal either to Draco directly, or to Granger, who'd been fooled by the promise that the dragons would be betrayed in the end after both forces had been depleted. Just as Ares' more trusted Chaotix should have been fooled into not shooting at the Sunnies by the promise of their firing fake sleep hexes and switching to support Chaos later. But it was possible that some of the Sunnies were loyal to Chaos and weren't firing real sleep hexes, and that was why Dragon wasn't winning the way their numerical advantage should have let them win. The next unit that approached was depleted, three soldiers holding wands on two other soldiers, who were swimming with empty hands. Draco gritted his teeth. More traitor problems. He needed to talk to Professor Quirrell about having some way to punish traitors at least. Conditions like these were unrealistic. In real life, you tortured your traitors to death. General Malfoy! We don't know what to do! Ceci shot Bogdan, but Ceci says Kella told him Bogdan shot Spectre! I didn't! Yes, you did! General Malfoy, she's the spy! I should have re- Somnium! There was the triple bell of a one-point loss from Dragon, and then Kella's limp body began to float away in the water. Draco had heard the word recursion by this point, and he knew a Harry Potter plot when he saw one. Unfortunately, Draco had not heard of autoimmune disorders, and the thought did not readily occur to him that a clever virus would begin its attack by creating symptoms of an autoimmune disorder so as to get the body to distrust its own immune system. General Order! Nobody gets to shoot spies except myself, Gregory, Padma, and Terry. If anyone sees anything suspicious, they come to one of us. And then... There was the bell of sunshine scoring two points. What? No one seemed to have gotten hit, and all the sunshine soldiers were present and accounted for. Except Parvati, who had been shot by some still unknown traitor in Padma's squad. And of course Padma had shot Parvati again in case she was faking, so it wasn't her. A sunny traitor in chaos? But all the ones I know about were supposed to strike during chaos's attack on sunshine. No! That was Chaos executing a spy! What? But why? 
and Draco got it. Because Potter thinks he's safe for how much he beats Sunshine, but not for how much he beats us. So he doesn't want to lose a single point when he executes a traitor. General order. If you have to execute a traitor, call Sunshine first. And don't forget to switch back to Dragon afterward. Longbottom's body drifted chaotically through the water. After Draco had finally gotten a hit in, they'd all shot him again, just to be sure. Nearby was Harry Potter, now protected by a prismatic sphere. If Longbottom had managed to shoot just one more soldier, Draco knew Harry was thinking. If the two Chaotix had managed to hold out just a little longer, they might have won. After Draco had reformed his forces and struck out again, the ensuing battle and execution of spies in Sunshine's name had left Sunshine exactly one point ahead of Dragon and Chaos both. Once Harry had started doing it, Draco had been left with no choice but to follow suit. But now they had General Chaos outnumbered 3 to 1, the survivors of Dragon Army and the last remaining Sunny Traitor, Draco and Padma and Zabini. I don't suppose you'd like to surrender? SLEEP BEFORE SURRENDER! Just so you know, Zabini doesn't actually have an older sister for you to rescue from Gryffindor bullies. But Zabini does have a mother who doesn't approve of Muggleborns like Granger. And I wrote her a few notes and offered Zabini a few favors. Nothing involving my father, just things I can do in school. And by the way, Zabini's mother doesn't approve of the boy who lived either. Just in case you still thought Zabini was really on your side. Draco raised his wand and began breathing rhythmically, building up strength for a breaking drill hex. Lagan, and the green spiral blazed out and Harry's shield shattered, and at almost the same moment, Somnium! Harry let out a long breath of relief, and not just because he didn't have to hold the prismatic sphere anymore. You know, I was pretty worried there for a moment. Special Order 2. If a sunny traitor doesn't seem to be really shooting at you, Fake being hit occasionally. Prefer targeting dragons to sunnies, but go ahead and shoot sunnies if you can't shoot dragons. Special Order 3. Merlin says, do not shoot at Blaze Abini or either Patil twin. Gryffindor's for chaos! Parvati Patil had finally gotten to assassinate and replace her twin sister, and she'd wanted to do that since forever. And this had been perfect. It had all been perfect. Thank you very much, and thank you as well. You know, when you came to me with that plan, I wondered if you were brilliant or crazy, and I've decided that you're both. And by the way, Harry said, now turning as though to address Draco's body, Zabini does have a cousin. Somnium. And Harry Potter's body floated away, his expression of shock and horror quickly relaxing into sleep. On second thought, make that Gryffindor's for sunshine. She started to laugh, more exhilarated than she'd ever been in her life. And then her wand spun around in a lightning motion just as the beanie's wand turned to point at her. Sorry, but I can't be totally sure you're for sunshine, so I order you to let me shoot you. Hold on! We're only ahead of chaos by one point! If you shoot me now, I'll shoot you in the name of Dragon, obviously. Just because we tricked them into doing it doesn't mean it won't work for us. Parvati stared at him, her eyes narrowing. General Malfoy said your mother doesn't like Hermione. I suppose. But some of us are more willing than Draco Malfoy to annoy a parent. And Harry Potter said you have a cousin. Nope. Parvati stared at him, trying to think, but she wasn't really good at plotting. Zabini said the plan was to secretly keep the scores of Chaos and Dragon as even as possible, so they'd used Sunshine's name to execute their traitors instead of losing even a single point. And that had worked. But... She had the feeling she was missing something. She wasn't a Slytherin. Why don't I shoot you in the name of Dragon? Because I outrank you. Parvati had a bad feeling about this. She stared at him for a long moment. And then... Somni! She started to say, and then realized she hadn't said for Dragon, and frantically cut herself off. Granger, 255. Malfoy, 254. Potter, 254. Hey everyone! Guess it's all down to me. 
Sunshine was ahead of Dragon and Chaos by exactly one point. Blaze Zabini could shoot himself in the name of either Dragon or Chaos, or just leave things the way they were. A series of chimes indicated that the last minute of time was running out. And the Slytherin was smiling a strange, twisted smile and casually toying with his wand, the dark wood barely visible in the dark water. You know, it's just a game, really. And games are supposed to be fun. So how about if I just do whatever I feel like? 